I'm gonna ruin the fun. <laughs> All right, so hello. My name is Emma Woodruff. I'm an archaeologist for the Hoosier National Forest. Um, and so I'm up here today. Normally I work down in Tell City, but uh, I have been working, or yeah, I've, I've been working with Diana. <laughs> She's definitely been uh, spearheading just about all of this. So today, um, what I'm going to talk about here really quickly is just a brief history of Lit Creek and then also what the Forest Service has done in the past. So I'm beginning this presentation with a brief history of the Lit Creek settlement. Uh, some of the families who settled in Lit Creek have been able to trace their ancestry to as early as 1925, but I'm just going to start this story in 1787. And so in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance is passed by Congress, which prohibits slavery in the Northwest Territory. And so the Northwest Territory consisted of lands west of Pennsylvania, north of the Ohio River, east of the Mississippi River, and south of the Great Lakes. So today, this territory includes present-day states Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota. And so this is a map um, from the New York Public Library from 1857. You can see the darkest gray-colored states are, slave, are, are states that practice slavery, while the states in the Northwest Territory are the lightest gray, which means that they did not legally recognize enslavement. And so in 1811, Jonathan Lindley and 11 other free black families emigrate from North Carolina and settle about 40 miles north of the Ohio River in s southern Indiana. So they traveled with anti-slavery Quakers who were also emigrating from North Carolina, and they were specifically going to <coughs> territories where slavery was outlawed. So then, in 1816, Indiana becomes the 19th state of the United States of America, and then four years later, in 1820, census documents 96 black Americans in Orange County. Within a decade, land records show that the first African Americans had purchased land in the Lit Creek vicinity. Benjamin Roberts, Peter Lindley, and Elias Roberts all purchased land in 1832. And so in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was amended from the original 1793 Act. And so this amendment increased the federal government's role in capturing African Americans suspected of escaping slavery and returning them to slaveholding states. Free African Americans were also under a heightened threat of capture and enslavement as their only proof that they were free were free papers. And those could easily be lost or stolen, though um, you know, many people, including people at Lit Creek, kept those things very safe and in specific boxes, which I'm sure Diana can tell you more about. Um, and so they were usually kept in secure locations and treated with care by those who needed to prove their freedom. And so the next year, Indiana enacts a Negro register that mandates all people of African descent submit themselves to a county registry. And so um, this register recorded information like physical description, distinguishing marks, free status, and personal character. And so these descriptors are essentially the exact same descriptions that, of fugitives that would be posted in newspapers and on announcement boards to assist with the identification and capture of um, just any African American, regardless of their free or enslaved status. And so um, here, this is a scan of the Negro Register that has some Roberts family members listed on it. So then in 1855, the Lit Creek settlement consists of 1,557 acres. And so that's all this red here. So it's um, quite large and spread out as far as like um, the land mass. So it's just under two and a half square miles. And so it's not um, a contiguous block, but it's spread out and separated by unclaimed land, Quaker farms, and other homesteaders. By 1860, the number of African Americans in the county reaches its peak at 260 individuals. So it's important to note that just like today, 
Some people may not have participated in the census or may have intentionally omitted their African American heritage um, from records for fear of reprisal in a region with Southern sentiments and strong ties to Kentucky, which was a slaveholding state. And so at this um, time in history, uh, you know, North and South was very at odds with one another. And so 1862, the Lick Creek settlement more or less disbands, and several families moved to Chatham in North Buxton and Ontario, Canada. And then in September of this year, nearly a third of all the land held by black farmers at Lick Creek was sold. The Homestead Act is also passed this year. So we'll probably never know why 1862 62 was the year many folks decided to pack up and leave what was by then an established community with a church, cemetery, and numerous farms. But it is likely that the free black community in southern Indiana had felt an increase in negative sentiments from their white neighbors as a result of the ongoing civil war and proximity to the slaveholding south. So here's uh, Deborah Bonds and Austin Bonds. So in 1911, the last African-American resident of Lick Creek named John Chavez sells his land. And then in the, eight, in the 1930s, the U.S. government begins buying eroded farmland from private owners with the goal of creating a national forest. It's during this time that most of the land associated with the Lick Creek settlement um, came under federal ownership. And so here on this map, you can see the Lick Creek settlement, um, where it is within the boundary of Hoosier National Forest. And then in the 1980s to 1990s, um, archaeological survey is conducted in the Lick Creek area. And so archaeologists and some students would walk through the woods and look for the remnants of the community that were um, visible above the ground. So these would have been things like um, Collapsed buildings, foundations, fallen chimneys, broken glass and ceramics, and also headstones at a cemetery location. So additional surveys um, that sought to identify buried remains, so just things like uh, cellars or, or just like a buried um, pit, those sorts of archaeological excavations happened in the 1990s and the 2000s. And so archaeologists also recorded one family cemetery with at least 13 graves, nine homesteads, one church, and one meeting house that are all associated with the Lick Creek community. And additional um, excavation and artifact identification was conducted by volunteers and professional archaeologists. And so here's an example of uh, what would have occurred during an archaeological excavation. And so here um, is a student, I forget which um, university that they were partnered with, but we had students um, helping to identify and record these sites. And then here are some of the artifacts that were recovered. There are things like pipes, um, ceramics, broken plates, um, animal teeth. And so now, in 2023, where do we go from here? And so for a lot of people, um, the obvious answer is probably like an enthusiastic tell the story, let's get the word out. Um, and so while that is, I think, a good thing to do, one thing we have to think about is how do we tell the story of free black settlements in America? Why do we tell the story? And most importantly, what is the story? So in this next slide, I'm just going to go over a quick example of how um, Lit Creek, the interpretation at Lit Creek hasn't always been the best, um, and not for lack of, not out of maliciousness, but just out of not talking to the right people to get the right information. And so misinformation about the Lit Creek Cemetery has persisted since at least the 1970s, um, when I believe it was a Boy Scout group, group had a community service project that took place at the cemetery. Um, the graves were cleaned and wooden crosses were put at grave sites. 
and in an effort to commemorate the cemetery, the Boy Scouts put up a sign describing the cemetery as a place where escaped slaves had been buried. And so history tells us that that is just not true. Um, assumptions about the past led a very well-intentioned group to commemorate the eventful lives and final resting places of free black settlers with a single line that grossly misrepresented the Lick Creek black experience. And so more recently in the 1990s, a lesson plan was created um, for fourth through sixth graders and Lick Creek was used as the template for this, um, but we were teaching archeology. span And so the history and how um, interesting Lick Creek is wasn't really the focus of this. And so that is something that in the future um, the Forest Service does want to uh, kind of revisit this lesson plan so, um, moving forward, uh, we can't forget the lived experiences of the people that archaeologists study and the voices of their family members. So we need to remember that while artifacts and sites tell us a story, objects are no replacement for the traditions and beliefs held by the communities who are a product of the history we study. And so it's vital that we consult with descendant communities prior to researching and interpreting their history and not the other way around. So the descendants of Lick Creek families expressed an interest in using their history to increase awareness about the black experience in Indiana. So today's descendants of Lick Creek are most concerned with maintaining the cemetery and don't want their ancestors' stories to be forgotten. And so um, we have been working with uh, what is now the Robert Thomas Bonds Historical Society that uh, Diana spearheaded. And her family has also been a huge part of making that happen. Um, and so moving forward, something that the Forest Service wants to do with interpretation at Lit Creek and any um, like activities that we do there is to reserve a seat at the table for the descendants and to ensure that their ideas and concerns are given consideration. And we would also like to create novel interpretive materials for schools and the general public that's accessible to everybody regardless of physical access to the site, education, or class. And then we also want to include descendants in conversations about the potential interpretive and maintenance projects that may affect the Lick Creek Cemetery, um, specifically the cemetery itself. And so that's really all I have, because um, I wanted to make sure that Diana had enough time to talk. <laughs> but I'll leave it there. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know who this is a photo of, but it's in our Forest Service uh, historical photos, so I, I thought it was appropriate, but I don't know who it is, unfortunately. Does it look good at all? Um, that I yeah, don't I know. It, it, it could be, but... Sure. Okay. Yeah, there's, I have no information, unfortunately. father was born in Mitchell, Indiana. My great granddaddy was born in Mitchell, Indiana. So I feel like Southern, Southern Indiana is our home. And we come back here every year. And I'll tell you about that in my presentation. But before I get to that, I'd like to thank the Lawrence County Historical Society for inviting the friends of the Robert Thomas Bonds and Friends Historical and Preservation Society to meet with you. I want to share with you information on why the preservation and restoration of Lick Creek or uh, Africa is important to us. <clears throat> Emma, thank you and the National Forestry for your support as we work together and labor to bring this dream alive. 
to Jeff and Rowena and Emily, my research partners who I call all the time, and to Dr. Stanley who's not here, Dr. Robbins not here, IUPUI, uh, African Studies Department is also not here in the audience. But thanks to them as well, because they have worked with us very, very hard to gather the information. I'd like to introduce my family. My brother, Steve and Stevie, and both of them. And my niece, Regina Bonds Johnson. And my newfound friend, Mrs. Mitchell, whom I met her son at Screen Mill State Park last year. And he came over and says, who are you people? <laughs> Got that for me. Got from you. <laughs> and I said, well, we're just here for a family gathering. Well, what family? And I started to say, he said, wait a minute, you got to talk to my grandma, because she probably knows all about you. <laughs> so that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, new friend to actually meet. How did this whole thing get started? Well, in June of 2021, I was listening to W. RTV, and they talked about the Weaver family that used to live in Lick Creek, but they moved on to Grant County, and they had lost their land. And the Weaver family stuck together all these years trying to get the land back. Finally, the farmers sold them the land, and they had the family on TV talking about it. And I mean, they really, really did a fantastic job in doing that. I said, I wonder if I should call her and talk to her about Lake Creek. And you know, when the ancestors want something done, they have a way of working through you. <laughs> so I called her, come to find out she was, she was a principal that I used to work with. And so we had a great conversation. Oh, you got to talk to my aunt because she's all over all this stuff. So I called the aunt. And she said, the Bonds family, the Roberts family, and she knew all the history of Lick Creek. And so I says, well, I want to meet with you. So I did. We had a wonderful time, a great time. And she encouraged me to pursue going to Lick Creek to see the cemetery and the land and the church that used to be there. So I says, what do I do? She said, well, call the National Forestry. They'll take you. And I did. I called the National Forestry. And they says, they gave me some numbers to call. In the meantime, my family's meeting around the same thing. And so in November or December, we put together a letter that we sent to the National Forestry explaining what it is that we wanted to see happen. And in that letter, we explained that we wanted to see preservation and restoration of the cemetery and the church. Now, we're thinking big. We're thinking Hollywood. We also told them we wanted some holograms that people could go into and talk and hear this amazing history. We wanted placards all along the paved driveway that would let people walk and read. We're thinking Hollywood, right? <laughs> so we get down, so we have several conversations. Rowena's a part of it, Emily's a part of it, and Emma and Tessa was a part of it. Several conversations. So finally they said, why don't we get a meeting date set up and we will all come down to Lick Creek and see it and we'll have a two day meeting. So that was arranged, and on May 21st and 22nd of 2022, they said you can bring eight family members with you. So the eight family members became the core of who was to work with the National Forestry. We came down, all eight of us, at sighted. And the first day, they took us to the cemetery. And Lord... I'm so glad he's up there because he helped me to walk it. 
from the parking lot down that trail. Well, that was nothing until I got to going down that hill and sliding and sliding. But when I got to the bottom and something came over me that I haven't felt since I left the shores of Africa eight years ago. And that something said to me, these are your people. And as I walked around, I saw Elias Roberts. And my grandson was with me. He said, well, who's this man? I said, that's your sixth great grandfather. Then we saw Matthew Thomas and Mary Thomas. And I was showing him who his people were. And I got very emotional, very, very emotional. And I don't get emotional, but I got very emotional on that day. And I had to pray. We had to start praying. Because ancestors were, were working with us. They are working through us. Because they want something done. They said to me, I've been laying here 210 years. <laughs> I've been waiting on y'all. <laughs> so we said, we have to do something. The next day, we met with the forestry. And boy, we had a meeting. We had a whole day meeting looking at all of the possibilities of what we could possibly do with Lick Creek. We had eight different sheets of paper. 30 people came to that meeting. Not only the National Forestry, but people came from Washington, D.C., Wisconsin, I think it was, and I don't remember the other states uh, that were there. But we also had the AME Church. We had Robert Settlement. We had professors from IUPUI. Indiana State, ISU. We had African Studies uh, departments. We had our attorney came. We had people from all over. 30 people filled this little small room, couldn't hardly move in it. Energetic and ideas just kept flowing and flowing. We could do education. We could do this. We could do that. And the excitement just built and built and built. So in the concept paper that we originally wrote, I bought a copy of that. But I also brought a copy of the agenda of what they told us to do. Because remember, it was just a core of us, just eight of us. And they suggested, the group said, you've got to get a website. You've got to get organized. Well, we hopped right on it. And we went back and got... 501c3, I think it is. And we called ourselves the Roberts Thomas Bonds Historical and Preservation Society. And we were so happy that we were able to pull that together so, so quickly. And then they said, get a website. Now, that took longer. <laughs> so we... Uh, Hired some people, and my niece, Stephen's daughter, Lynette, knew how to do a lot of things. And we hired a lady to work with her to put it uh, together, who has become our main coordinator of our website. Now, the website wasn't as easy to do as we thought it was going to be, because we had to think organizationally, what is our message? What do we want to say? How are we going to say this? And so... As we begin to think and look at other historical websites, they were dull. They didn't have that mm that we wanted them to actually have. We wanted to really say something, and we wanted it to be connected back to our African past. So we wanted to know more about who were those ancestors that came on the belly of those ships and landed in Virginia. Who were those people? Well, we couldn't find that out. But we began to read books and books. And my favorite book is 400 Souls. And this did a great deal of helping me to shape up what those people looked like. This is a children's book called Born on the Waters. And we liked this book so well. We says, okay, this is our theme, <coughs> Born on the Waters. This is our connection between Africa and North Carolina. We also use other books. And of course, if you are a historian, you can't get around Coy Robbins' work. I've forgotten who's yours. 
<coughs> and we used, he was so wonderful. He has so many great things in here. We used a lot of what he offered. We also used our own family history book, which we had commissioned. Uh, Bill Dietrich, uh, uh, Dietmers, he is the historian for the state of Illinois. And we, did, we had this done in 2006 for our 50th uh, family gathering. Bill did a fantastic job, full of facts, full of information. He traveled and went to North Carolina. He came down to Orange County. He went all over, making sure his facts were uh, uh, correct. We also used a book that my cousin had written about the family stories and where the families were, where they came from, and who they were. We also used our Bonds picture book. This was done in 1978. And to know who the Bonds were, we put it onto a placard for you. And I think what we'll do, Regina, is pull the one of Austin and Debbie, which is right here, and then pull the one of, of the children. This is my great-grandparents. They were, thank you, they were, thank you, yeah. And the one over there is their children, okay? And so we put these placards uh, together so people can really understand. And we try to connect the picture of who they were back to an African setting. And one of the things I've learned on my journeys is that the African family includes the dead. It includes the living. And it includes those who are yet unborn. Because the dead is still with us. We have pictures of them in, uh, in our homes. We have Bibles with their names uh, uh, inside the Bible. And we feel their spirits from time to time. And then we did a, a placard for Debbie and Austin's children, the 12. And one of those 12 was my grandfather, Clifford. And so that's kind of what we started doing, pulling this all together. We also pulled pictures of the church, the AME church, and the Baptist church that was in sessions in uh, Mitchell. And we also pulled pictures of grave sites, and we stuck meaningful statements with those so that we do not forget, we do not forget. And so as we began to really think about what do we want this website to look like, we knew we wanted it to start with, well, I guess it's gone. Okay. We wanted to make some cultural connections, some cultural connections between our ancestors. We thought we would start with our actual mission. Why did we want to have the curriculum stored? Why, why, why? Well, the mission of the RTB Society is to promote, preserve, and spread the stories of African Americans who settled and lived in the Creek, African American settlement between 1812 and 1902. We want to tell their stories to educate our community on the strength, culture, and families of this pioneer village. Just scroll down to the next one. And we look at our vision. Our vision is preservation and restoration of Lake Creek, Little Africa, Pioneer Settlement. Our goals, in 1820, free people of color from North Carolina purchased land in Indiana to pursue life, liberties, and have sanctuary free from racial oppression. Goals of the descendants of these pioneers, settlers are one, to preserve and restore the 200-year-old cemetery land in Headstones, the ruins of the AME Church built in 1842, narrative plaques, this is Hollywood, holograms that <laughs> tell the stories of Lake Creek settlers, resiliency from 1820 to 1902, and three, 
through partnerships with other historical societies, educational institutions, and other Hoosier National Forests, uh, advocate cultural tourism and recreational opportunities for people of color and those that live in the area, as well as Lick Creek Settlement, free educational materials and curriculum with both virtual and written stories about the early settlers available to the public. Now, if you go back up and you go to about, just click on it. Okay. Now, when you go to about, we're looking at the Roberts, Thomas, and Bonds family. This is a story of free people of color living through the era of slavery, segregation, and racial oppression. In their lives, they have demonstrated resiliency, endurance, the ability to adapt to hostile environments and racist practices. These families were one of the first black pioneer families, free people of color, to come to the wilderness in search of freedom from racial harassment and oppression. All had freedom papers from past uh, indentures or slavery. They were a community of farmers from North Carolina whom had a tight-knit family relations built around the church. They had hopes and dreams of pursuing a new life of freedom in the new state of Indiana. Go to the next one. Now this is where we were trying to give our viewers <coughs> to connect. We, we needed to connect. Who were these pioneers? So we began to look and read. I told you the, the books we had been scouring through. Mm -hmm. So the question was, what kind of people were these ancestors? As described in the book, Born Up on the Waters by Nicole Hannah Jones and Renee Watson, our African American's beginnings were born up on the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Before our ancestors ship landed in the new colonies, we had our own culture, languages, and communities rooted in Africa. Kidnapped from West Africa, our historical journey was probably in the late, and I'm guessing on the 1600s, 1650s, somewhere around there. Before slavery became a stronghold in the newly uh, emerging colonies, ours is not an immigrant story but based on a story of resistance, resiliency, perseverance, faith, and survival. We keep going. Our ancestors were kidnapped. They were not allowed to bring their culture with them. On the three or four month journey in the dark belly of a ship, shackled, hearing strange languages, our ancestors chose not to be swallowed by the ocean. Like thousands of others, we are descendants of those who chose to live. Go on. Their hands, their hands were, were knowing. They knew how to hold a baby close, how to rock that child to keep him from crying. Their hands knew how to mix herbs and how to get that just right flavor for a meal. Later on, we call it soul food. <clears throat> Their hands knew how to beat and shape iron. They knew how to plant seeds to grow food to feed their families, how to make garden tools and weapons. They knew how to make music to keep them company as they worked, how to sing and dance to celebrate, to mourn, and to worship, to offer thanks. They knew how to use their minds. Having lived in the kingdoms of Ghana, Songhe, and Mali, they understood learning, medicine, math, and science. They were strong-willed, intelligent people with the fortitude to face and overcome whatever obstacles were placed in their way. At some point, they became free people of color. Free people of color were trained for the more skilled laborers, like slaves did the hard labor. However, if you were free, then you did another kind of labor, like babysitting or working into someone's home. 
Even though they were free men and women, they could be arrested and held until they proved themselves free. They could get their freedom papers and were required to show them up on demand to keep from being held in a local jail. They needed white witnesses to their character and their freedom. Free blacks had a wide range of occupations. There were blacksmiths and masons and carpenters and shoemakers and tailors and seamstresses and so forth. After surviving in Virginia and North Carolina, the Roberts and Thomas families bought land and traveled by wagon across the mountains to the Northwest Territory in search for a sanctuary free from racial harassment. The land they bought in Indiana was hilly, uncleared land that was not being used for farming, but they could buy it inexpensively and clear it to make it tillable. Hard work was not an obstacle, just another hurdle to clear. Our ancestors were successfully free people of color. The number of land transactions they took, that they took part in in Virginia, North Carolina, and Indiana, it is astounding when you read these. It is pages of transactions which would be overwhelming for the reader to actually uh, decipher. The Roberts and Thomas forefathers, they were aggressive investors in land from the time that they were freed in the early 1700s. Now we'll go on down, and this shows you a genealogy map of Margaret Roberts in 1725. It's the last day we have, first day we have on her. And Margaret was the mother of, I think it was about 10 children. And she had a son named Ishmael. Let me go ahead down. Now he's my favorite character. <laughs> he's a badass. <laughs> he fought. So Ishmael was born in 1755 and into 1826. Her oldest son was head of the household of 10 other free people of color. In, 19, in 1719, he received pay for serving in the Revolutionary War. Service from June the 3rd, 1777 to June 3rd, 1778. As a private in Colonel Abraham Shepard's company, Colonel Shepard gave him a certificate which stated he was furloughed at headquarters Valley Forge. To return home with me, who was enlisted in my regiment, for the term of three years and return home with me to North Carolina. Can you go any further? Ishmael was a smart businessman. He knew how to hold on to land, turn it into a profit, which turned into wealth. Ishmael was an aggressive landowner, buying and selling over 1,300 acres of land. He was a land investor, not a farmer. The descendants of Ishmael brought and sold over 2,325 acres of land in North Carolina. Today, that would be a four square miles of land. Even though a law had passed that did not allow people of color to carry guns in 1841, Ishmael was allowed to carry a firearm after he took them to court. Badass. <laughs> he was married to Sylvie, a Cherokee Indian, and they had 15 children. Now, I didn't believe they had 15 children. I kept saying that to, to my research team. Nah, 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 nah. Well, I did a little bit of dirt uh, of digging, and I found that in his will, he gave money, he left money to 16 children, but only some were not Sylvie's. And in the court records, it showed that he had been, was taken to court for fathering a child out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. But he beat the case. <laughs> yes. Let's go on. So the question is, why did our ancestors leave the Carolinas? Why did they leave? In 1791, 700 miles from the U.S. shores, enslaved Haitian men and women led a slave revolt. You may have remembered that from your, uh, your books in history. They were able to defeat the French army, overtake the island, and set up their own government. This sent fears throughout the U.S. government. 
slaveholders and citizens. The, uh, a letter went to George Washington from Governor Pickney from South Carolina saying that he had to have slave uh, patrols because there was so much fear in his state that they would riot there. And he had to have people to make to, to uh, keep them down. Well, I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, what eventually happened there is that that was the first law after that slave uh, revolt. Then more and more and more laws were actually passed. Okay, or maybe we should get it back. But as more laws were actually passed, they were they were very cruel laws. Free people of color could not own a dog. They could not own a mule. They could not buy liquor. They could not own a horse. All of these restrictions were placed upon them. And the last one was they could not preach. They could not preach. So whites were afraid that the enslaved persons were going to ride up to South Carolina and North Carolina and use riots and were highly uh, distrust, uh, distrustful of free blacks because they felt they would go tell the master what it was they were going to do. Beginning in 1826 and the 1850s, North Carolina passed a series of very strict laws termed the Free Negro Clause uh, Code. And this is by John Ho Franklin, a noted uh, historian in Howard. Uh, John Ho Franklin uh, says that free African Americans lost the right to vote and were required to obtain a license to carry a gun. That's Ishmael. He, he solved that issue. Uh, later restrictions on free blacks make, took away their rights to preach, own a dog, own a mare, or any intoxicating liquor and could not move from one county to another <laughs> without permission from the government. As these laws continued, the tensions began to rise and Nat Turner and the slave revolt in nearby Southampton County played a major role in the passage of these laws. It is also possible that moves against African American population helped to divert the attention of what was happening to the economy in the 1830s and 40s. It was going boom, 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 boom. And so in the common, when the, your uh, economy starts to slip, this country has a history of going to war to bring it back up, okay? So our ancestors chose to seek a new life in Indiana to pursue life, liberty, and happiness as a family. If you could go back up, to, uh, that's the people that lived in North Carolina. That's not the ones who lived here. If you could go back up to the other part that gives you, go on the back under a bout and click on the first one that says, that's what I, yes. Well, this is Indiana. This is the people that you probably know the most about. And this is the Roberts family, uh, Elias, he married um, Nancy Archer. Elias' father was Ishmael, but Elias was, Elias was quiet. He worked, he took care of his land. Nancy's father was also in the Revolutionary War. So you have two Revolutionary War people buried in that cemetery. And they came about 1820. Elias and Nancy, were part uh, Cherokee. And he, uh, with Elias Roberts, were issued at Chatham County, North Carolina, his freedom papers. He kept on him, him at all times. And went on to say that he was the son of Ishmael Roberts, the Revolutionary War soldier. And the same for Nancy. Her father's name was Thomas Archer, a Revolutionary War soldier. So the two got married. Go ahead down. And they both were born free, and that's his papers, his uh, certificate of freedom going down. And
And they bought land, and they were able, and they had eight children. And the oldest was Mary Polly Roberts. And she married my grandfather, Matthew Thomas. Elias Roberts left money and land to his grandchildren, and one was Mary Bond. Mary Bonds was married to Monroe. Go ahead, Dad. There's his headstones and so forth. And there are their children's names. Now, we're going to have to work on these trees because <laughs> that's, that's, that's the hardest part of this job are all the trees. Okay, I'm telling you. Okay, so let's go going down some more. And that's it. Go back up to about. Go to the next person. And this is my, one, another one of my favorite people. If I had to choose an actor that this man remind me of, I would have to say it would be Chadwick Boseman. Mm -hmm. Chadwick, you, you could have saw him in the movie. He was quiet. He was a thinker. He planned. He was visionary. And he didn't cause trouble. He let the trouble come to him. When it came, he prospered. Well, Matthew Thomas, one of my grandfathers, I would always say he is Chadwick Boseman through and through because he was indentured at the age of 13 to a Quaker family. It was three boys. It was Matthew, and it was William, and it was Jordan. These three boys were all taken in, one was a, a t taken by Thomas Chapman, and I think Matthew went with a Lindley family, and so did Jordan. All the, the families kept them until they were 20, 21 years old. When they left the families, they received uh, 40 acres. They got a coat for $30, a plain saddle and a griddle, and a freedom suit of clothes. And Chapman agrees to also to provide the boy a good common school education. The next one, go down, please. Lucy was their mother. She came here, and as coming here, she lost her husband on the trail. He died. She gets here. She's got three boys to take care of. She can't cut down no trees. So she had to put them somewhere where they could be taken care of. And those families took, a little quicker families, that took <coughs> those three boys in. I like Matthew because he took what he learned, and he was able to double his land, the 40 acres he earned. By the time he married his wife, Mary, who was the daughter of uh, Elias, he had doubled that land to 80, and by the time he died, he had 322 acres of it. Now, I think that is perseverance. That's showing that you got some love of it, you understand how to use money, and he got along with everybody. He was one of the trustees of the AME Church. Uh, go on down. And that's about his brothers. And it's all on the website, and you can read that. You go back up again. But he's my second favorite one. Go back to about, go down to the Bonds family. Now we're getting current. And Mary Thomas married Monroe Bond. And you see how the name changed from Bond to Bonds? And we said, what? what? How do our names change? And someone told me, he says, well, in Mitchell, there were so many children. Grandma had about 12 kids. And they would say, here come those bonzes. <laughs> and so they just started putting the S on the end of the name. Because they said, here come the bonzes, they put the S on the end. So Mary and Monroe married. And uh, when she married him, uh, Monroe didn't stay long. He was kind of a wanderer. And she, she, but um, Mary's father had left her the 322 acres. He uh, left them to her, and she bought, each child got an acre, she, and she bought the, her other brothers and, uh, and sisters out. And then Matthew, they said that Monroe was unable to pay the taxes, and the land was auctioned and sold to a white farmer. Now, Mary and Monroe divorced, 
and Monroe moved on to Lyle Station down in Gibson County, another black settlement. And in Gibson County, he married uh, Amanda Anderson, and uh, he was a barber by trade, but became blind. Blindness runs in our family, about every fifth generation. Uh, he was a barber by trade. They had a daughter named Beatrice, who married and had a son named Monroe Thompson. Monroe Thompson grew up in Paris, Illinois, and the Terre Haute area. And Monroe is buried in Eagle Cemetery. Go ahead, Thompson, the next one. Now, they're their children. One of those, named Austin, is my great-grandfather. Okay. Go ahead. Now, Austin marries, uh, Reuben Bond marries uh, Penelope. We were trying to clean up this bond and bond stuff, <laughs> but we didn't do a good job with it because Monroe, we found out that Monroe, who was a, the son of Penelope, but she was not Reuben. He was not Reuben's child. Reuben had been dead 10 years when she came up with Monroe. <laughs> so she gives, gives Monroe the last name of Bond. Well, I guess it got changed to Bonds, okay? <laughs> And Austin uh, was, one, was one of uh, Monroe's sons, and that's my great-grandfather. And he and Austin was born, and tells where he was born. Go ahead down. The other siblings were also in the family, and it goes on down. And he, my, Austin marries Debbie. Go back up a little bit. Okay. And Debbie, this is a story here, just found this out about three weeks ago. Debbie uh, was a constant, and the family lived up in northern part of the creek. Well, uh, her mother, Elizabeth, was raped by a red-headed Irishman that worked on the railroad. So she had Debbie. Debbie was two years old, and she married uh, Archibald Good, who lived up in Jennings County in North Burley. And so she went to where he was, and that's where she stayed. Archibald had some brothers. One was named James Good. James Good lived down in Mount Vernon in Posey County. And one night, four men were lynched, and one was James Good. Now, I knew, we knew nothing about this until three weeks ago. There was a young girl named Sophia, I think her last name. But she's a high school student, and she decided that the killing of seven black men in one night needed to be rectified. She's 17 years old, dear heart. So she led a campaign in Posey County to have a bench uh, erected, and a wealthy person gave her dollars to pay for it. And the bench was unveiled this past fall. And honor James Good's name is on the bench. I was contacted by a researcher in Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, who is a researcher that does nothing but look at legends. And he called to say, are you the granddaughter of Clifford Bob? I said, yeah. Was Debbie your, I said, yeah. I've been kind of leery here. <laughs> who are you? <laughs> And he says, I'm a researcher, and I'm researching the death of James Good. And I think you're kin to James Good. I said, I don't know him. She says, well, he was, he's the brother of Archibald Good. He said, now my name rings a bell. I said, but he lived in Jennings County. He says, but his brother lived down in Posey County. And one night, they were accused of raping I think it was the ladies of the night, three of them, and these four men, of course, denied it all and denied it. But that same night, a mob came into the jail and took them outside, all four, and hung them. He sent me the pictures of these four men hanging from the tree. He sent me the, night, the 1878 newspaper article that had happened. And I, my family just could not believe this. Oh, I'm not even kidding him. 
Yeah, kind of. You're still your grandmother that you were kind of kin to. So it's been a big thing in our family trying to rectify this whole thing. And the more and more information I got, the more information he sent me, the more upsetting it really became. But this little high school girl named Sophie led that charge, 17 years old. And she has gotten national attention. It was on, I, I mean, I've heard it on others, but I didn't think it meant me. And now I know it means me. So, this is Debbie's, Archibald Good would be Debbie's brother, I mean, uh, uh, no, her husband, but James Good would be her brother, would well, be her in-law, bro brother-in-law. Well, that's Debbie and Austin, okay? Going down. And this is their children, all born and raised in Mitchell. So you see why they would say, here come the Bonses. <laughs> when they came to school, there go the Bonses. <laughs> so it was 12 kids into a family. And I'll show you something very shortly in a few minutes going down. And this is Ruby and Clifford. That's my grandfather and that's Ruby. Go on down. And that's their children. And William is William Thomas is my father. Every year, the Bonses have a reunion in Mitchell, Indiana. Now, my grandfather, when I was 11 years old, and you know, back then, 11 year olds took on a lot of responsibility when the parents worked. And mine was to take care of my grandfather every evening. I had to bring him some soup and some crackers. And I would sit there while he watched Papalong Cassidy and Gene Arkin. <laughs> and so, like a white TV. And he would tell me stories. He would just tell me stories about his life. And I knew it growing up that Pop Soul would just hop in that little truck of his and come down to Bedford. He'd go to Mitchell to visit the uh, Wigglytons. He'd go over to visit Aunt Sadie or in, in here in Bedford. He'd go to Bloomington to visit. I mean, he knew everybody. He knew the Chandlers. He would go, he'd be gone all weekend. And so he'd come back home and go back to work on Monday morning, sober as I don't know what, didn't create nothing for the week. <laughs> on the weekends, the hot soul gone. And so he would tell me all these stories about these people that he knew he was played on a Negro baseball team and in this area. He would go to Muncie to visit Doc Cruz and the Thomases in Muncie. He just went all over, visiting all the people from this area that had spread out. So this reunion, he told me, he says, I'm going to be gone, but I want you to make sure you come and see me every Father's Day. Or once a year, you come and see me. He's buried in the Mitchell Cemetery with five other generations of Barneses. So, every Father's Day since 1956, we have had a family reunion in Mitchell at the park. That's where I met Jeff. And he come over, who are you people? Who are you guys? <laughs> and we would simply just, I mean, I, I love Jeff. I love Jeff. There was so, about 30 of them. Well, you know, that, that's not a, a common sight in Mitchell, no, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the reunion is held every Father's Day. And this past year, I think it was in 2021, we had 125 people came from California, West Virginia, Texas, Illinois, all the <coughs> We decorate the graves and then we go to the park and we have fun. If you scroll down a little further, I want to show you a very brief video of my Uncle James, who grew up in, in Mitchell. Now, I would never do what he did. You can click on that. Can you click on that? Yes, 
Well, that was taken 30 to something years ago. Let me scroll down some. And if you scroll down, this is what was taken two years ago. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of us. <laughs> and so this was like a hundred and something people that came to this reunion from all across the country. Now, the strange, the strange things about us, we don't have no invitations. We don't have no emails going there's no calling. If you are a Clifford Bonds family member or Bonds member, you know to have your behind in Mitchell at 11 o'clock at that graveyard. <laughs> and no one is going to stop you from coming, but we don't need to do anything 
anything really fancy. This year we did. This was our 65th year of coming. And each family wanted to have their own color t-shirts of the Bonds family. And so we're the blue ones, <laughs> you can tell. My father had uh, six children, so we're in the blue, we, we have multiplied. And then we have all the other band uh, members. This is a part, some of them are uh, in a canoe in the caves. That's my daughter in the front and her family. That's more of my cousins and nephews that were also there in the cave, okay? You can go back up all the way to the top and I will let y'all go home. <laughs> and, but I just wanted to show you uh, one more thing that really touched me when it came in. If you go to our stories, and Jeffy gave me this. This is the story of the man who slept for 26 years. His name was John Bond. John got mad at his mother because she was going to sell the farm. And he told her, no, 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 you can't sell the farm. And so he, I'm, she said, I'm old, I'm in my 80s, I can't do this work anymore, I just gotta sell this bond. And she said, two daughters, Martha and Mary, Martha, Mary, and John. <laughs> so John was slow down some, he was uh, out in a storm, go down some. And in the storm, he got very, very wet. And as he got wet, keep going, he decided that when he got home, he was never intended to work anymore. And true to this, his farmer promised his mother he refused to do any more work or be reconciled in any way. Well, his mom sold the farm, going down, and John went to bed, and he didn't get up for 26 years. <laughs> now, thanks to Jeff, we got that, uh, that story, and going down some more. And this story touched me more than anything else. I asked my family to write a story about what Mitchell means to me. My name is Reverend Gregory M. Bonds. And as far back as I can remember, we've been going to Mitchell, Indiana, to decorate my grandpa Popso's grave. After that, we always go to Spring Mill State Park for a family reunion picnic. At a very early age, Mom explained to me that the reason we go to Mitchell is that Popso made his children promise that they would go every year and decorate his grave. It was uh, May 30th. We changed it to Father's Day because it was always wet and rainy down here. I was born in December 1955. Popso, Popso passed away in March 1956. I can remember sitting at the park and listening to stories as we ate about my grandfather. And it seemed to me that everybody knew and had a story about Pop So except me. I told Grandma how I wished I had known him to show me that I did know him. She dug out an old photo of Pop So and me as a baby just before he died because I lived with him not only was I the last grandchild to be held, but she said he would spend hours holding and rocking me in his last days. After, and he became, that, and that became a Popso story. That I did not know Popso had more important, that I did know Popso, and more important, he knew me. Because even though I never knew my biological father, my first experience of that it meant to be loved and held by a black man was taught to me by my grandfather, Popso. I can remember that when, I thought, when I'm feeling low and lost because I didn't have a father. I had loving uncles who stepped in to help and fill out the boy, but still to this day, I can close my eyes and feel the love of Popso and my family rocking and holding me up. That's, that's what's going to Mitchell means to me. It means continuing to carry out and fulfill the wishes of Popso and everyone we've buried there since. It also means celebrating our Bonds family. 
We are a very close and loving family. Grandma and Pops <coughs> instilled that in their children, and they instilled it in us, and we in our children. Mama always said, when you pass by family, you pass by it all. And that's the end of this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions you have? No. Sure. I must say that uh, my aunt Helen graduated with Gus Grissom. She was crazy about him during the same class. <laughs> my uncle James's picture is in the, uh, well, maybe so. And, and he, he played basketball for Mitchell with uh, Shepard. We have two sons that were real good. Dave and Billy Shepard, and they love basketball. And uh, the bonds is real good in baseball and basketball in Mitchell. So I didn't know to hear those stories all the time. But they love they their hometown. They really did. I had a question about the, the name, the Lit Creek Settlement. Was that the name that the family uh, gave the cemetery? We that name. <laughs> we called it Little Africa. Little Africa. That's what, that's what I, I think remember. that's what a lot of people call it, and the name got changed. I don't know when and where or how, but they had several names. It was Little Africa. Some called it Patty's Garden, yeah, that's what and mean. some called it the Creek. So I mean, it was just just toss them all up and take what you want. I guess. So you don't find it offensive to be called Little Africa because we absolutely. That's what I think what we've been told. You know, it's like oh, you can't this, say this, that. This is Karen Padgett. She's been taking people on history tours to oh, to the okay, Little Africa. Okay, nice to see you. Mm -hmm. No, we're not at this bit. I've been to Africa eight times. I've been I've studied in uh, in Egypt for four summers on the Nile Valley Civilization. I've been in West Africa and studied three or four of the different tribes over there. We're not offended at all. As a matter of fact, we're trying to find this link <laughs> to help us understand what kind of people. Were my ancestors? What did they bring here? Mm -hmm. And what did they do in Africa? No, well, I don't believe in Tarzan, but <laughs> if you look at that movie, you would think that's all they did was move the trees. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So we had to find the fact, uh, historically, that Africans were who came. Many of them had studied medicine because they were able to help those farmers and help those plantation owners with, with their with their planting. Many of them had gone to uh, Timbuktu, which is, was the only college there at that time from like the 1300s up to the 1600s. So when we begin to really dig into the African past, it makes us understand what skills did they bring, but also what attributes did they bring? What kind of people were these? They were survivors. Now, that we found out they were survivors. They were uh, resilient. They had endurance. They had a respect for God. They wouldn't have built a church in the meeting house. They, so, and they were close knit. And so they were able to go through the oppression and the racial hatred to a point. And then they had to leave it and come here. And they got here, and the same thing began to happen in the 1850s. <coughs> and so many of them left. Uh, they create them into other places. My family stayed. And I call that resiliency. I call that wanting to survive. And I'm proud of them for it. I'm very proud. So, yes, um, but to name names, that's fine with me. I did a documentary on Reverend Jordan Chandler, and oh, I found out that he was part of a group that left North Carolina yeah. to Lit Creek. Um, I did the documentary, and now I'm doing a documentary on the colored church and helped to restore the church in West Baden. And I came across the name Samuel Chandler affiliated with the AME church. So I called Reverend Chandler and said, who's Samuel Chandler from French Lick and down in that area? Well, he goes, oh, that's my grandfather. I go, you didn't tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's really interesting. So does your family... Are they part? Are you kin to the Chandlers? Whenever we have a funeral, the old people, you know, the old family, no. Yeah. 
Reverend Chandler is one who sings, plays, and preaches. <laughs> yeah, so he, uh, he's, very, he's very well known for his words. For it. Yeah. yeah. The or it's in my, on Helen and that age bracket, they all knew him very, very well. Now he married Ma Thomas's daughter. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if the Thomas, because a lot of people migrated to Bloomington. Ma Thomas, uh, that's his mother-in-law, Portia Thomas. <coughs> so I didn't know if that was part of your Thomas. I don't know. We have not, we, well, we did find some Thomases last week, and they were in Muncie, Indiana. And they were, were glad to hear this. My brother in California <coughs> had gone to school in Muncie, Ball State, and he knew this young lady. So he called, he said, well, y'all, I think that's my grandma's name. Let me check with her. So we have, we have found some Thomases that live. Most of the Thomases I know of lived in Gary, Indiana. And those Thomases were the daughters of um, Bill Tom, William Thomas. One, her, her name was um, Mary Finney. And Mary Finney was known as a fortune teller. And so the family didn't go around with them much because she's a fortune teller. <laughs> so I, so my, my father decided that I was, in, I was in Ball State. I left Ball State and I went to teach in Michigan City, Indiana. Well, my dad decided to come up and visit. So he says, I'm going to take you over to meet, meet some people. So he took me over to Gary, Indiana on Massachusetts Street 710. 1710. He said, now this is your grandpa's first cousin. And this lady with long hair came to the door. Beautiful lady. And she said to him, I know who you are. I know you were coming today. So she opened the door and she let us in. And so she said, come with me. So I sit there on the couch because it was kind of dreary in there. And my father went with her to this room. And she, they came out. He said, okay, we can go now. I said, Daddy, what, what happened? He said, so she gave me my numbers to play. That's So, I mean, I'm just real with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's kind of what happened. Yeah. And, you know, it was me and my brother and my mother. And he finally see it. It was fun. It was fun. And so, when he finally came out, he was happy, right? And she was kissing and hugging him when he left the door. I said, Daddy, what are you doing there so long? She just gave me my numbers for the week. So that's, that's kind of why he wouldn't see her. Okay. So that became a big family thing. He went to see her. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer for you? Yes, ma'am. Um, we have always been told that the residents of Lick Creek came with the Quaker families. You have outlined a little bit in here that they were landowners and they've been landowners. Uh, investors, but how were they related? Did they have relations with the Quaker family? Yes, as a matter of fact, <coughs> in Austin Bonds, my great grandfather was very religious, and they, and he was worked with a Quaker family. He grew up with them, and a lot of those the teachings. He took back to his family. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, the lights were out at six o'clock. Everybody in the morning was up at five o'clock. You had to say a verse before you could eat. Very staunch belief system was my great grandfather. And they said that he, where he grew up, a Quaker family lived down the road or next door or something. I think it was the Lindy family or the Stout family, I remember which one. But in any event, that's where he got his Quaker uh, influence. And in some of the books we have read, I've read quite a bit, they talk about the influence of the Quakers as helping these free blacks and leading to North Carolina. But the, but the Quakers left too because of the same type of feelings. You know, you can't preach. You can't go to church. You can't have assembly. So they left as well. So the wagon trains of people coming to this Northwest Territory looking for freedom, liberty, justice for all, you know, just those type of things. But yes, you're right. Did the 
come with the Quakers as uh, slaves and no. then released here? No. No. They, they, were, they were free people were free that people. came with the Quakers just as you follow behind somebody, like a car would follow behind you. And the cars would be just following each other. Well, this time it was wagon trains following each other. Okay. And there was safety in those numbers. You set the rest of the myth that I had heard. Uh, they were not slaves. Yeah. No, they were not There were 11 families that traveled with them among 281 people. <coughs> uh, I think those families, that, there were several different bunches of people that came. It was not one bunch. It was just a bunch here, a bunch there, and a bunch there. As a matter of fact, Matthew Thomas was already here in 1808. And then others came in, in later years. But um, the Quaker families were kind of a shield in case someone would think that they were going to uh, kidnap them and put them back into bondage. Because you're not that far from the Ohio River, not that far mm -hmm. from Kentucky. So there was kind of some protection there. Mm -hmm. Do I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Butzer, any connection with the Underground Railroad coming here? Now, we talked about that, my researchers and my family. There's no history of Underground Railroad that we can tell. Mm -hmm. But people see, keep saying that there was Underground Railroad. But we're not sure. We don't have any evidence of it. And in my research, um, the, the, I think Chambersburg mm -hmm. was one of the stops. Mm -hmm. And they could have come right through Lake Creek. I mean, it, it, you're right there at it. But we don't have any evidence of it. It's just hearsay. No, that was secretive. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what about your shawl? Oh, what's it going Yeah, the, the people who are best at it. You yeah, you didn't want to decide that. There's a question. Yes. yes. Um, my Quaker family, their last name was Chamis. Uh, they came to Indiana in the early 1800s as well. However, they settled in Wayne County first, Richmond, then to Henry County, they did Castle, and then they went to what they called Indian Territory, and they were able to settle there. It was the first white settlers in the area. <coughs> but anyway, when they left North Carolina, um, and they traveled as a, a clan, a group, I thought it was interesting that when they talked about when they left, mm -hmm. they brought people with different skills. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why the African Americans may have been invited to go along, because they wanted someone with medical skills so we cut down this. So they all. My grandfather was a cobbler, so he made shoes on the way. Uh, but each of them had a job to do to get them from the Carolina in the few months it took them to come to Indiana. Well, the the research shows that if you were a free uh, person of color, you usually had a higher skill level. You know, you, you know how to work with your hands, or you knew some trade. There was a. Over the field, <coughs> in one of the books, about a man who had a blacksmith shop in Paola. And he took in uh, indentured children and taught them that trade. So there were three kids of color who went to him and he taught them whatever blacksmith he is. But yeah, but I, I think you're you're quite right. The, the, there are cases where the quick I don't see any free black coming to this country across those mountains and through uh, Kentucky without some protection. So, mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.